But first, uh, yeah, we should talk about uh, Lula's successor, uh, Dilma Rousseff, and then uh, and then uh, how the right in Brazil managed to remove her from office. Yeah, so, you know, Dilma's a fascinating story. When she was 23, she actually picked up arms and became part of the armed resistance against the military dictatorship. She was a Marxist guerrilla, and she hadn't killed anyone or engaged in any violence, but just being part of the resistance meant that she was in danger. And one day she was kind of abducted by one of the darker parts of the military regime and detained for two years and brutally tortured to turn over information about her comrades and the resistance movement. Um, so the idea that, you know, 30 years later or 25 years later, she would become the elected president of a very patriarchal country was all obviously unthinkable. And it was really Lula, especially because Dilma was never, is not really a classic politician. She's not particularly charismatic. She doesn't, you know, she doesn't make people feel warm in her, you know, it's a, it's an interesting conflict that a lot of female politicians have. They have to show strength, but that can be alienating. Um, you know, I think Hillary Clinton had a lot of the same issues, but she was this very efficient technocrat, very competent, smart, and efficient. So Lula anointed her and she won easily in 2010, but in her first term, the economic crisis of Wall Street in 2008 started really reverberating in Brazil, causing a lot of economic problems. That in turn caused problems of crime, of unemployment. And then at the same time, this huge corruption scandal in 2014 erupted with Petrobras at the center of it. And she had been the chair of Petrobras under Lula's administration. And so she kind of became at the center of it. And so in 2014, they thought they were finally going to be able to beat the Workers' Party after losing three times in a row, 2006, 2002, 6, and, and 10. They kind of had this uh, neoliberal kind of senator that they had, came from a big, famous Brazilian family. And they almost won, but they barely lost. It was like 51 to 48. She was reelected. But the problems got worse. They never The right never accepted that defeat. And so in 2016, about 18 months after she was elected, they impeached her on completely frivolous grounds. That was when I started the Intercept Brazil um, because I was so vehemently opposed to that impeachment. I could see it was the first kind of unraveling of Brazilian democracy. They were just intent on imposing on the government and on the country. Her center-right vice president, who was from a different party, that's how you know multi-party coalitions work, and they wanted, he was just a 75 year old gray lawyer who never could have won. People didn't even know him, but he was at the end of his career. And he's like, I'll impose all the austerity that you want. And they, they did it. They impeached her, imposed him. And so for me, that was really the start of the unraveling of democracy that set the stage for Bolsonaro. So, so, o senhora é impedido no Senado. Pode pedir para o Supremo rejeitar ou definir se cometeu um crime de responsabilidade e também o Supremo poderia parar o processo, mas até agora o Supremo não fez. É possível que o processo que está sendo conduzido sob autoridade, um, tri um tribunal legítimo, pode ser um golpe? Veja bem, são duas coisas completamente diferentes. O processo, pela lei brasileira, transcorre no Senado. Eu posso recorrer ao Supremo Tribunal e o farei quando for adequado para a minha defesa. Mas, no ínterim, ele correrá no Tribunal. Ele irá transcorrer dentro do Senado. O Senado é o Tribunal, correto? A partir daí, o que eu posso fazer é discutir se, vamos dizer, os procedimentos foram corretamente levantados, foram corretamente aceitos, nos deram ampla direito de defesa, nos deram, não houve nenhuma, nenhuma, vamos dizer assim, nenhuma interrupção no processo. Nós estamos recorrendo disso. Nós não conseguimos eliminar, mas as ações estão no Supremo e serão, obviamente, levadas ao pleno do Supremo. O, o juiz individualmente, ele não deu ainda é, ele não aceitou dar a suspensão do processo. Agora, ele te, eles terão de julgar. Mas vai ter a oportunidade para pedir que o, o Supremo define se cometeu o crime depois. Depois. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so what's the like, like what you're you're talking about with you know with with Dilma in uh, in that that clip is uh, is the 
you know, the way that uh, that this this could be considered sort of a lawfare coup, you know, that they were they were using like transparently uh, absurd grounds to, uh, to to impeach her. It was like basically like a sort of accounting, you know, method that, you know, that was that was commonly used that, you know, that they, they were uh, that was, you know, like it was so it was, it was treated as if as some sort of, um, you know, like, uh, you know, like nobody really took seriously, I think the idea that this was a, a politically neutral application of the law at the uh, at the time, and in fact, I believe uh, Jair Bolsonaro, then then still in uh, in Congress, uh, uh, dedicated his uh, his vote to impeach her uh, to uh, to the like the commandant at the uh, prison who tortured her. Yeah, you know that in, I haven't seen that interview in a while. It's really interesting um, having watched it just now and and remembering that was the first interview she gave after the lower house had voted to impeach her. So just like in the U.S., the same system, the House impeaches, the Senate then has a trial and convicts or acquits. And that day that the House impeached her, it was an overwhelming vote to impeach her. It was one of the ugliest things I've ever seen. It lasted about nine hours. And, you know, the fraud of it was that the the most corrupt gangsters in the world were the ones who led the process against her. The guy who was the president of the House who okayed and gave the green light is now in prison for 15 years. He had millions and millions of dollars in Swiss bank accounts from bribes and everybody knew it at the time. It was very uh, misogynistic too. You know, it was all these men who were just like reactionary and conservative standing up saying re revolting things about her. Both Bolsonaro and his son, Eduardo, who's also a member of Congress, dedicated their yes vote to the torturers who had actually tortured her. Nesse dia de glória para o povo brasileiro, tem um nome que entrará para a história nessa data, pela forma como conduziu os trabalhos nessa casa. Parabéns, presidente Eduardo Cunha. Como vai, deputado? Perderam em 64. Perderam agora em 2016. Pela família e pela inocência das crianças em sala de aula que o PT nunca teve. Contra o comunismo, pela nossa liberdade, contra o Foro de São Paulo, pela memória do coronel Carlos Alberto Brilhante Ustra, o pavor de Dilma Rousseff. Como vota, deputado? Pelo exército de Caxias, Como pelas vota? nossas forças armadas, por um Brasil acima de tudo e por Deus acima de todos, o meu voto é sim! So I think that in that interview, she still didn't believe really the reality of what was happening. I mean, by this point, there had already been leaks from key members of the Senate in the in the, in the center right party where they were saying on tape, impeachment is a done deal. It's an agreement between it's a national pact between the military, the Supreme Court, you know, all parties that we need to have on board. And you can see she's still trying to believe in the like legal process saying, no, I think I, you know, the legal process is being followed, whereas all her followers knew. And I think she knew deep down that this was an absolutely, you know, coordinated effort to finally do what they couldn't do for 16 years, which was destroy the Workers Party, remove them from power. And of course, the Senate did end up convicting her. Um, the leader of the Senate impeachment effort was the guy she ran against and defeated and he ultimately ended up getting caught on tape plotting to murder his own cousin as a witness to his corruption. Um, and the vice president also got caught on tape once he became president, plotting to uh, pay bribes to the guy who was leading the impeachment effort. So the whole thing was, you know, done by the most grotesque, corrupt gangsters. And yet it was really the corporate media led by Globo that had been against the Workers' Party forever that spun this narrative that this accounting method she had used that is used by leaders all over the world and that is trivial at best as a transgression was some kind of grave, you know, act of corruption, defrauding the Brazilian people. And that's why support for impeachment rose to the level where they could get away with doing it. Yeah, and um, I'm glad you mentioned Globo because this this gets us into uh, to something that's that's a big part of the book, uh, which is that you know like they had like 
you know, Globo liked you when you were, you know, we're exposing the NSA, you know, uh, you know, spying on, uh, on Brazil, uh, you know, but, um, but they, uh, they, they turned pretty hard uh, over originally uh, the, the Dilma impeachment and then you know, sort of adversarial relationship with a lot of the Brazilian you know, press comes up a lot in the book. Yeah, I mean, so two things, you know, one is the impeachment was supported almost unanimously by the four or five largest Brazilian media outlets. And Brazil has notoriously media uh, outlets are concentrated in the hands of like three or four oligarchical families. That has always been a huge problem hovering over Brazil, but the worst is Globo. Globo, for example, became Globo. The Mourinho family that owns it are three sons who are each billionaires. Their father became one of the richest men on earth by serving the military dictatorship. When there was a military coup in 1964, Globo had a headline depicting it as a revolution against communist tyranny. And he then became kind of the spokesman for the dictatorship. Brazil, Globo apologized for this in 2013. So like decades later, once that guy was long dead, but they have always been at the center of everything there. There, there's no other country where there's a media outlet that powerful, a country the size of Brazil that dominates so much like Globo does. And so, yeah, I did my NSA reporting in Brazil with Globo precisely because of their dominance. And I had a great relationship with them, but not, it wasn't just impeachment that they were behind and really responsible for. And I became one of the leading voices because we established the intercept, intercept Brazil to oppose, oppose impeachment. But also it was this anti-corruption probe led by Sergio Moro, who became Bolsonaro's uh, minister of justice and security. And it was kind of a weapon from the beginning aimed at the workers party. And it was Globo and the Brazilian press that turned Sergio Moro into this Superman, you know, this kind of high priest of ethics. They put him on every magazine cover. They turned him into like a religious figure that no one could question. And so it wasn't just my opposition to the Dilma's impeachment that caused a lot of animosity with the Brazilian press, but particularly my growing criticisms of how this anti-corruption probe was being conducted, particularly led by... Sergio Moro. So it, 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 you really can't talk about Brazilian politics without talking about the central role of its concentrated media led by Globo. Yeah. Uh, I, was, I was just smiling because I could hear, uh, hear one of your dogs barking in the background. Uh, and I, I remember, um, you know, it takes me back to sitting in the, uh, the, the studio where, where TMBS was recorded when uh, Michael was calling you up to uh, – uh, interview you know i think before you got started i could hear like a bunch of them barking at the same time <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah people complain if there's not a dog bark at some point in my interview <laughs> fair enough uh yeah so i, I want to um so so yeah i want to get into uh tomorrow and uh and this is like this is kind of a remarkable thing you know that there's there's no like the status that he had uh, you know, basically before uh, the uh, the leaks, you know, that, that you reported uh, is ki- is like there's there's not a lot like there's no obvious analogy, you know, for uh, for a figure like this uh, in any other country. You know, he was on the the time, you know, he's the only Brazilian on the Time magazines, you know, 100 most influential uh, people in the world. Uh, you, you mentioned him, uh, you know, being sort of elevated to Superman. And he was like there were literally images of him with like the Superman uh, outfit. Uh, and uh, he was such a uh, you know immensely uh, popular figure and and such a revered figure uh, that uh, when he joined uh, Bolsonaro's government, he he was able to to negotiate this this kind of astounding detail deal for himself. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know the 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 iconography of Sergio Moro became so immense. You know, there were they're like in every city in, in Brazil, you could find gigantic, like life-size murals of him on the side of buildings. He, you know, really became a religious figure. And it wasn't, you know, entirely invalid. Um, Brazil, from the time of the dictatorship, was run by systemic corruption. And this guy came onto the scene. You, you can tell he's, you know, like his early 40s. And he led this team of prosecutors that were even younger in their 30s. And their argument was, we're the first generation born into democracy. We're here to clean up our country. And for a while, there were even a lot of people on the left. I was one of them who supported what they were doing because they were sending billionaires to prison for corruption. And as an American, 
Yeah, right. <laughs> I never saw that before. You know, I lived through the 2008 financial crisis. I lived through the invasion of Iraq and torture and rendition and illegal spying. And I never saw any of them go to prison. So I thought, wow, this is important to see, you know, heirs of billionaire fortunes going to prison. O que nós percebemos é que a corrupção é um crime tão grave como o homicídio, pelo menos a grande corrupção. O impacto maior da corrupção, os estudos da, da transparência internacional de outros órgãos apontam, não é só no crescimento, é na distribuição de renda e na justiça social. Uma estimativa da ONU aponta que 200 bilhões de reais são desviados pela corrupção anualmente no Brasil. Com esse dinheiro, nós poderíamos triplicar o investimento federal em saúde ou em educação. Nós poderíamos ainda multiplicar por cinco tudo o que se investe em segurança pública no nosso país. Nós poderíamos ter por ano 10 escolas a mais em cada cidade brasileira. Em 97, a cada 100 casos de corrupção acabam em nada. A Lava Jato tem sido até agora um ponto fora dessa curva da impunidade. Todo esse caso é um triunfo institucional. Existem várias outras instituições trabalhando, existe o Ministério Público, existe a Polícia, a Receita Federal, outros órgãos têm colaborado. Até muito pouco tempo atrás não se via criminosos desse porte, políticos, senadores, pessoas assim que até pouco tempo viam a impunidade como um elemento principal da, da sua vida. Mas rapidamente apparent that they at some point started abusing their power. Um, I think nobody can sustain that level of reverence. And it got to the point where they were, you know, it's not a good thing when the most politically popular figures in the country are not politically accountable. And they drove almost every single major political event, including impeachment, um, just through the stroke of a pen. Um, and you know, it, it, it really, it, it's hard to overstate how, as you said, um, how popular and powerful of a figure he was to the point where even the Supreme Court, higher courts, Congress, the media were afraid to challenge him or oppose him because he had this huge army of Brazilians behind his back and they thought he was the savior of Brazil. So everyone was petrified to challenge him. And, and so what happened was the key event for Moro was in 2017, after Dilma's impeachment, Lula had been term limited out of office in 2010. You can only serve two consecutive terms under the constitution, but you can run again. You just can't serve a third consecutive term. So everybody knew Lula was ready to run for president in 2018 once this vice president that they installed, you know, was gone in the 2018 election. And all polls showed him far ahead of every other uh, candidate, including Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro was sort of in second, but a very distant second to Lula. And so, the oligarch class said, wait a minute, we just went through all of this turmoil. We, we, we impeached Dilma. We installed this guy. We got everything we wanted finally. And now we're going to let Lula just waltz back into the presidency. So the prosecutors, this anti-corruption team, brought very dubious corruption charges against Lula in 2017 as he was getting ready to run. And they cheated. It shouldn't have been with Judge Morrow for te the technical reasons referred to in that video you first played. Um, but they knew that they needed to keep it with Judge Morrow because he was secretly plotting with them to make sure that they would quickly find Lula guilty and then have this appellate court that was very subservient to the whole corruption probe affirm the appeal. And then once that happens under Brazilian law, Lula became barred from running. And that's what they did. They found guilt Lula guilty. Morrow sentenced him to a decade in prison very quickly. Um, the appellate court very quickly affirmed it. He, they, the police came, they took him to prison and he was barred from running. And that's what led the path to Bolsonaro, eased, Bolsonaro's easy victory in 2018, because Moro had removed from Bolsonaro's path to power, his greatest obstacle, which was Lula. And then the first thing 
Ben, the first thing that Bolsonaro did upon winning was he turned around and he made Sergio Moro this offer to join his government, knowing that that would become a an anchor of legitimacy for his government was to have Sergio Moro join his new government as the minister of justice. And, you know, Bolsonaro ran ridiculously on an anti-corruption platform. I say ridiculously because he was a congressman from the epicenter of corruption in Rio de Janeiro for 30 years and was involved in every component of corrupt transactions, but that was his branding. And so to have Moro come and join his government was a huge coup. And Moro, Bolsonaro needed Moro more than Moro needed Bolsonaro. And so he was able to negotiate for this new position that was of unprecedented power where all these powers that had been previously dispersed throughout multiple agencies of surveillance, uh, monitoring of finances, law enforcement, the, the federal police were all consolidated under his control. And he agreed to accept the position only on that ground. And the media started calling him the super minister. And he easily became the second most pow powerful figure in the country, if not the most powerful, as soon as Bolsonaro's victory was sealed.